but Genesis chapter 24, this is the famous passage where Isaac gets his bride, Rebecca. So uh, let's just start here at the beginning. And the thing is why this chapter is like, kind of long is it repeats itself. So he's kind of, he goes through this whole story and then he's telling Laban the whole story. So there's a lot of, there's a little bit of repetition there. So obviously, you know, I'm not going to preach on that and then be like, well, I got to preach on it again, <laughs> you know, at the same time. So, uh, but Genesis 24 and verse 1 there, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, that he had put I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of, of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So this whole chapter is about how this servant of Abraham is going to go find a bride or a wife for Isaac. That's what this whole chapter is about. And so it's, it's a pretty simple chapter if you're just looking at it as far as just the physical aspects of what he's doing here. But what's interesting about this chapter is more so the picture of uh, what's going on here with the Trinity and, and with uh, what I'm going to liken unto a soul winner. Okay? And so what we see here is a strong picture of, of, uh, of a soul winner going out with the Holy Ghost to go win somebody to Christ. And, and so what, what you see here is you see Abraham who, who would represent the father and Isaac would represent the son. Now the servant, I've heard this preached where the servant would represent the Holy Ghost, but, and, I, and I can see where they're coming from with that, but I think the, the servant actually would be the preacher or the prophet. And uh, actually the angel that was going to go before him would represent the Holy Ghost. And so there's a lot of pictures in here as far as when it comes to um, Isaac would be the bridegroom and Rebecca would be uh, the wife. And we see this parallel, we see this allegory of, of Christ in the church and he's the husband, the church is the wife, the bride of Christ. Okay. And so there's just a lot of pictures in here with that. And I just kind of want to talk about this uh, Jesus being the bridegroom and uh, and the you know the the believers or the saints, and it it talks about the church, but you know it you know people will talk they'll say the bride of Christ, but it never says the bride of Christ, you know, and it never you know it never says it like that. Um, what we're going to find out is that the bride is all believers that are going to be when he comes, and there's going to be obviously the New Jerusalem that's going to come down at the very end is called the bride or the wife and the bride, and so. When we're talking about that, we're talking about all believers would make that up, okay? And so not just Baptists, not just, you know, the, the New Testament church, but all believers. Now go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And obviously we're going to get through the, the, the physical aspects of what's going on in this story, but there's a strong picture here as far as the father and the son and how he's sending out a servant to go find his bride. And there's a strong picture of soul winning in this, in this chapter. Okay. And uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, it says, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but the disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So Jesus is calling himself the bridegroom. And John chapter 3, John the Baptist is calling, him, calling Jesus the bridegroom. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, this is where they're coming asking John, you know, basically that Jesus is baptizing more than him and all this other stuff and and this is his answer to them it says in, in verse 29 so John chapter 3 and verse 29 he that hath the bride is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice this my joy therefore is fulfilled 
he must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So, obviously, John the Baptist is likening himself unto the friend of the bridegroom, and Jesus would be the bridegroom, right? And he's saying, I must, he must increase, I must decrease. Now, if you think about this with this servant that's being sent out, how he's the friend of the bridegroom, but he's going to find the bride. Now, obviously, John the Baptist would be part of the bride too, right? But you've got to understand that, you know, when, when we're using these pictures and stuff like that, nothing ever fits perfectly, and it's not always going to be that way all the way through as far as the picture, right? Because we're likened unto Jesus' brethren, right? He says, I'm not ashamed to call them my brethren. But then in another place, he says that, that the church is his bride or his wife, right? And so, you, do, you don't take things too far, okay? Because that's what we're going to see here. And so, when it talks about, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, well, John the Baptist was the greatest prophet that was born of women. So, John the Baptist, the friend of the bridegroom, was the prophet. And he's winning people to Christ and the bride, so to speak, Okay? And uh, go to Matthew chapter 25. Now, this, we went through this parable, Matthew chapter 25, of the ten virgins and the bridegroom coming and all that stuff. And so you can see how this all fits with his coming and all this. So you can, when, when, I, when I look at this story, I see a picture of what we're in right now, which would be in the New Testament where you have the Father and the Son that are in heaven, and he's sending out his servants with the Holy Ghost, to find his bride, you know, which would be going out winning people to Christ. And what we're going to get into is that he keeps saying, you know, he's saying, should I bring your son? Or should I bring your son to the place? He's like, no, don't bring him there again. Because Jesus isn't coming down and ministering to people and finding his own bride right now. There's, they sent out a servant to do that with the Holy Ghost. And so Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1 it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole parable because I already preached on the whole parable. Uh, but in verse 13, we know, what is this talking about? We just got done with Matthew 24. goes straight into Matthew 25. So we're talking about the second coming of Christ. Because it says in verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So when it comes through this whole parable about the bridegroom coming and the door was shut, what was that talking about? The Son of Man coming. So it's talking about His second coming. And so, and like that, lightning's going to shoot from one end of heaven to the other, right? No, but, uh, but go, to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So I, I, I kind of wanted you, I want you to see this picture. And, and obviously you can just have the story and the fact that he had a faithful servant that went out and this was miraculous that, that he just led... You know, God led Abraham's servant to Rebekah, and he even had this prayer where he said, you know, she's gonna, I want her, the, the young virgin to do this, and she does it. So it's a miraculous event of how God leads uh, Abraham's servant to, to find Rebekah, okay? But we can see, well, how does this apply to us now? Well, think about when you think about soul winning and how God will lead us to divine appointments and God, you know, the Holy Ghost will lead us to, uh, to people that need to be saved. Uh, you know, all the aspects as far as how they were welcomed into Laban's house. And we talk, you know, you think about soul winning where you come up to a house and if, if the, the peace of the Son of Man be there, then, you know, then stay there. And if not, then, you know, knock the dust off your feet. And he's got, it, all that stuff kind of really applies in this. And I'm not going to be able to get to all of it, okay, because we don't have that much time. But go to 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. So we can see here that Christ is likened unto... Uh, to a bridegroom, we see that we're likened unto virgins that are to be chased unto him, right? Because we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to have that, and, I, and this isn't where we're eating biscuits and gravy. This is where we're coming on white horses, and the fowls are going to eat the flesh of kings and, and of all those that have taken the mark of the beast. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is. But uh, 
and obviously the wedding parable, you know, you had the wedding parable, you have uh, going out into the highways and hedges. Remember, he had a wedding prepared for his son, and they, didn't, they said they didn't want to come. And then he said, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. All these passages would fit with this. And obviously in this story, we're talking about one man and one, wife, and one physical wife. But obviously when we're talking about Christ and his bride or, you know, the church, we're talking about multitudes of people. And so Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and again, you don't take these things too far, right? Um, people will take this too far, and you got reprobates like Jack Scop that'll take this, this idea of, of Christ being the husband and us being the wife, and it'll take it way too far, and way too literally, okay? And I'm not going to mess up your minds and tell you what he has said and, and everything else, but it's wicked, it's reprobate. And so you can't take stuff way too literally when, it, when you're looking at these pictures, right? And especially when you, when you see that it's not the same picture all the time, right? And so we're his children, we're his brethren, and we're his bride, right? So all those things are just pictures and it's, and it's the ways to explain our relationship with God, right? The authority structure. That's what I really see when I see the picture of Christ and the, and the bride, because notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body, because he's going to resurrect our bodies, right? It says in verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice how it keeps going. Husbands and wives, Christ and the church. And it's showing the similarities. It's showing that authority structure in, in, in both sides there. Verse 27, this, he's talking about the church right here. It says, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives their own, as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth, nourisheth it, nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So you see these two aspects here, and obviously when we're looking at this story, if you're just looking at just a, this is what this story is about, you're talking about a man and a wife, right? We see at the very end of the chapter, he's comforted after his mother's death. So you can see that, you know, he's leaving father and mother and cleaving unto his wife, right? And you see this whole picture of a man and his wife and this whole story about that. But you see how that also parallels into, you know, Christ and the church and how he's finding his bride. And especially since you see the servant is the one that's finding the bride and not the son himself, right? And that's the way it is right now. We're, we are ambassadors for Christ. He has given us the, the word of reconciliation, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, and we are beseeching them in Christ's stead. And so this just parallels perfectly with the New Testament and what we're dealing with now. Now, uh, go to Revelation chapter 19. So this is obviously the place where, you know, we see that. We see where we're a chaste virgin to Christ. He wants to present us a chaste virgin. Uh, you know, the church is supposed to be spotless and blameless. And we, we kind of went over this. Remember, we were in 1 John chapter 2, and we were talking about how abide in him, that, that uh, little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we uh, may have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so uh, that's what we're talking about is the second coming of Christ, and we want to be a chaste virgin, so to speak, before him. We want to be uh, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And we're talking about flesh, fleshly speaking, right? You walk in the Spirit and you're living for God and you know, you're doing everything you should be doing that when He comes, you're not ashamed of what you've been doing, right? In your life and, and, and walking with Him. Now, Revelation chapter 19, this is the actual marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, this is, this is the, the marriage. And it says in verse uh, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and His wife hath made herself ready. So who's his wife? 
Well, it tells you in the next verse. The next verse it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. So we see that the wife is arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of what? Saints. So who, who's the bride? The saints. And so we see that that's clear. Jesus is the bridegroom. The saints, all saints, would be the bride. And so, uh, Revelation 21. Now, people get confused about this, but Revelation 21, it, it talks about the bride again, the lamb's wife. And in this case, it's actually talking about a city coming down from heaven. And in Revelation 21, verse 9, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So what's the bride that he's talking about? The city. Now, when you're talking about a city, you're not always necessarily talking about the physical buildings. You're talking about the people, right? If I said New York City is wicked, I'm talking about the people, right? I'm not talking about the buildings and the structures, right? I'm talking about the people that are in it. And so when it talks about Holy Jerusalem coming down, obviously we're talking about the people. And obviously he, he describes the physical city. So when you say the city, Holy Jerusalem, there's two aspects of that. The people that are in it and the actual physical city itself, right? And both those would be right. And so, uh, but Hebrews chapter 12 links these two. So we're talking about how, okay, well in nine, chapter 19, the bride are the saints. In chapter 21, the bride is the, the city itself, right? Well, Hebrews chapter 12 links these together, dealing with uh, Mount Zion, or, you know, uh, it's showing the difference between Mount, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And it says, but ye, in verse 22, so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, so that's what's up in heaven right now. And anybody that dies in the Lord is up in, in that city, up where on the mountain of God. And, and to an innumerable, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we see here that when we're talking about New Jerusalem, do you see how those are linked? We're talking about the physical place, but you're talking about the people that are in it. The General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. Okay? So, right now, everybody that's in heaven is, is congregated. So, that's why it would be the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. But when down here on earth, or all around the globe, you know, you have churches. Right? You have physical, local churches that make up the body of Christ. You know, there's a body here, there's a body there, there's a body there, there's a body there. There's a body there. And, you know, we're not all congregated together right now. Like all the churches that are in America right now, we're not all congregated together. And so that's where people get confused about that. But you have the general assembly in church of the firstborn that's in heaven right now. Right? And so when we're talking about the saints, we're talking about this new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, you know, that's what it's talking about is at the end when you have the marriage supper of the Lamb and then the bride coming down at the very end after the thousand year reign. And so, just want you to see that, that sim similarities. So, uh, go back to, to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. What's interesting about this is that we just got done reading, well, we read Genesis chapter 23, but before that was Genesis 22, and what was that whole story about? Isaac being offered upon the altar, and what did that picture? Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And it's no marvel that, the, that you know, a couple chapters over, now we're talking about the, the Son and the Father are together. He's sending out servants with the Holy Ghost, you know, like so to speak, and he's got getting his bride. Isn't that exactly how it's, it's, it is now? You have the Gospels, you know, and then you have Acts. And you have all the apostles going out with the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 5, it says, and the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? 
And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou that uh, beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. And so he's saying, you know, my son's not coming back there. You know, you're going out there to get my bride. And notice what he says here, because the servant's asking a legitimate question. He's like, what if they don't want to come? You know, what if she doesn't want to come? And it says in verse 7, the Lord God, uh, this is where he's talking about the angel. It says, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and I swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. So he's basically saying, listen, if you go there and she's not willing to come, then you're clear of this oath. And it reminds me of Ezekiel where it talks about uh, the watchman, you know, and if you, if you go out and warn them, then you're, fl they're, you're free of the blood of, their, uh, you know, of, of those people, right? And, you know, in, in Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33, it covers that as far as if you warn the unrighteous and then, you know, they, they, go, they don't, don't turn to God, then... You're fl they're free of their blood. But if you don't warn them, then their blood is on your hands. And so you kind of think of this servant is he's basically taking an oath that he's going to do this. And God, you know, Abraham, in this case, is saying, you're free from this oath if, if she doesn't want to come. Right? It's kind of like if you go out soul winning, you know, you give them the gospel and they don't want it, you know, you're free from that obligation. You think about the duty of the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel and how it's our duty to preach the gospel and how that's what you know what we're supposed to be doing and if we don't preach the gospel how the blood of the hands of all the unsaved are on our hands if we don't preach the gospel and but we're free from that if we give him the gospel if we give him the chance right we can't force him to come and he's not saying to force this this woman to come to be his wife and so he can see how all that works out but he's sending that angel before him okay and so, uh, but it, it's whosoever will. You know, you think about when it says, if she be not willing. Well, think about that with salvation. Salvation is not forced upon anybody. It's free will, Calvinists. And guess what? There's a free will offering. So these people are like, oh, there's no free will in the Bible. Then explain the free will offering to me then. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it talks about uh, the fact that it, salvation particularly is of our own will. Go to Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 21 again. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And it's interesting because this chapter is talking about water too. It's talking about a well and bringing water to the camels and just all these different things. I'm not going to go into all the different avenues, but you think of the woman at the well, think of the, you know, the water of life, all this stuff. Um, you know, all that stuff is definitely linked in there when it comes to salvation. And that's what this chapter, I believe it's, it's a servant going out with the angel of God with him. And he's, he's going to find this, this, this woman. And it's, it's a good picture of soul winning. Okay. And how, you know, the, the father and the son are in heaven. You know, you kind of think about that. The father is up in heaven and the son is sitting at his right hand. And he's sending forth his messengers or his preachers, so to speak. How shall they hear without a preacher? And he, he, and we have the Holy Ghost with us to find, to lead us, right? Lead us to those, those unsaved people. And so in Revelation 21, verse 5, it says, And he, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. With that in mind, talking about I will give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely, go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, and verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Sound familiar when you think about the angels going to go before him? I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. 
And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that hear it say, Come. And, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And so salvation is a free choice. It's by your own will. And what we saw with Rebecca when we read this chapter is that she was willing to come. She was willing to, to be Isaac's wife. And so the Lord led him there. And so when you think about this, how the, the Lord led him there in, uh, in verse 27 of, of Genesis 24. So Genesis 24 and verse 27. It says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the Lord led him there. And you think about this with the Holy Ghost leading us. And you think this happens all the way through. I mean, you think about Acts, how the Spirit would lead him and tell him to go in one place and to the other. The Spirit would forbid him to go in certain places and all this stuff. And so you can definitely see that in the book of Acts with the Holy Ghost leading, leading people to go certain places. Right? But what's the, you know, think about what the ministry of the Holy Ghost is. Because the Holy Ghost came down to us and we had the indwelling of the Holy Ghost after Jesus was glorified, after he, you know, after he rose from the dead and you remember he said I you know unless I go to my father the comforter shall not come and so and go to John chapter 16 John chapter 16 and it really kind of shows us the ministry of the Holy Ghost and everybody's always like you know you need to have the conviction of the Holy Ghost and this is the only thing that's even close to that, okay? And it doesn't use the word conviction, okay? We need to use Bible terms. And I'm not against the word conviction, you know what I mean? It's not like that's a bad word or anything like that. But it's like the word sovereign, you know? It's not in the Bible. And so that people just make up definitions for it. The only time convict, you know, someone was convicted was when the, the, the Pharisees brought, the woman brought, uh, took an adultery and they were convicted by their own conscience, Okay, not the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost, though, what it says is in John chapter 16 and verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now here's a good three-point outline it's going to give you right here, right after this. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Okay? So, the Holy Ghost has a ministry why he's down here and what he's doing. But the, what's the number one thing that's mentioned? Of sin, because they believe not on me. So you think about the reproving of sin and how the Holy Ghost is working with you. When you're, when you're given the gospel, the Holy Ghost is there working. You know, if he's not, then nothing's going to happen, right? And you think about the Word of God, right? The Word of God, the, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And, you know, those things work in tandem as far as God's Word, Jesus is the Word, but the Spirit of God working in there as far as them hearing it and believing it. And so, uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. I just want you to see that with the Holy Ghost working there. So in this physical passage, we have this servant of Abraham that's going out and finding a wife for Isaac, the son of Abraham, and this angel is going before him to, to take care of this. And he prays to God saying, you know, give me a sign pretty much and tell me who, you know, if, if she does this and this, I'll know that that's the one you want me to, to bring back to Isaac. Okay, and you see this throughout Acts. You see all these different cases where stuff like this happens, um, where an angel came to um, Cornelius, you know, and you, just different aspects of the Spirit leading them in different places and stuff like that. But uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9 there, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with 
the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So notice when the preaching of the gospel is with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And so that, that's working in tandem. You have the Holy Ghost with you as you're preaching the gospel to win people to Christ. And so when we go out soul winning, what are we, what are we doing? We're trying to find... We're trying to find the bride for, for our Savior, right? Now, obviously, we're all a part of that. You know, just as much as John the Baptist would be a part of the bride. But he's called the friend of the bridegroom. And think about this. Ye are my friends if what? Ye do whatsoever I command you. And so, uh, John the Baptist, obviously, if he's the greatest prophet that was ever born of women, I'm sure he would be considered the friend of God, okay? Considering Moses was a friend, or Moses spoke with, with God face to face as a man doth his friend and Abraham was called the friend of God and they were all prophets but John the Baptist was the greatest prophet born among women that's huge right that means he was above all of them according to Jesus so when it says that he's the friend of the bridegroom that makes sense right he's definitely the friend of Jesus and so uh, but but obviously, when we go out soul winning, we're trying, to, we're trying to win more people to be a part of the bride. You know, if you think about the bride as being a collective group of people, you know, at the church or the believers, so to speak. And so, we see, we see the, the, those, uh, those attributes, right? And the fact that the Son isn't coming again, you know, like, to, to, he's not down here. His, his earthly ministry is over, you know, as far as preaching the gospel and doing all that stuff, he's up in heaven and we're his ambassadors and he's given us the Holy Ghost to do that. So that all fits, right? And I think about that, you know, bring not my son hither again. I think about the reprobates that try to crucify the Son of God afresh. You know, and they're constantly, you know, well, why doesn't he come down? Why doesn't he show himself, you know? And all these false, you think about all these false religions, what are they constantly saying? You know, Jesus came back. You know, or he spoke to us again. You think of the Mormons, right? That's one of their big things. You think of all these, the Seventh-day Adventists and, and all these cults that were started. It's all about, like, th this extra revelation from Jesus, right? And so, all that stuff, you know, it's basically saying that when Jesus went up and sat at the right hand of the Father, it, it, you, know, you know, after Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, he was the last one to see Jesus, the Bible says. He was the last at least to be called apostle, right? So he was the last one to see Jesus. And so that's what I believe this is showing here is that just as much as Isaac isn't going back into his, that land, Jesus isn't coming back into this land until he comes again, obviously, and brings in with his bride. So um, all that stuff fits. Um, but, you know, when I think about this, I think about the fact of you know, how hard it is to find a virtuous woman, right? You think about soul winning, we're like toiling to find somebody to get, get saved, right? And how hard is it to find a virtuous woman? And that's what I see with Rebecca. I see a virtuous woman. I see someone who is doing good not because she thinks she's going to be rewarded. She had no idea who this person was, right? She had no idea that he was rich and that she was going to marry into a really good family, right? She was just being a good person. You know, she was just, to, to me, you know, when you think about people, go, go back to, you're in, back in Genesis chapter 24. Um, when you think about uh, knowing whether someone is, is not a hypocrite, is what they do when no one's watching, right? You know, when, when you're not at church and you're just at home, let's say you're home by yourself, what do you choose to do? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you doing what you should be doing? Are you doing something productive, right? Or do you fall into something else, right, when no one's watching? Now, when you have a family and kids, they're, they're always watching. <laughs> so it kind of keeps you, you know, away from that type of stuff, right? But that's what defines your character as far as what you do when no one's watching or when you think no one's watching, right? And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll see people, you know, I'll, and they'll, they'll be like giving the gospel something. We go to these conferences or you go to, uh, out and you'll, you'll find people that are like-minded and stuff like that. And, you know, they had, you know, it's not like they're putting on a show. You'll just see someone giving the gospel to somebody and you just know like that's just what they're doing, right? And I've, I've seen it with my friends. I'll, I'll, you know, they'll just be out, you know, I'll be meeting them up somewhere and they're just giving the gospel to somebody, you know, and, and they didn't even know I saw them do it. And so that's the type of person I see with, with Rebecca here. 
in verse uh, 10 there of Genesis chapter 24, first we see where did the servant go? And this, he's going back into the land of where Abraham came from. Remember, he's from Ur, the Chaldees. And Laban is actually called the Syrian later on. You know, it's Laban the Syrian. And so we know that this is outside, you know, in the Chaldees or in, this, in Syria, in that realm of where they're living. And it says in verse 10, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the, uh, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So he's going into Mesopotamia and the city of Nahor. So Nahor was his brother, right? And if you remember, Haran was the one that died before Lot. Nahor was his other brother. And so he's going back into Mesopotamia. And that's where they all stayed. And Abraham's the one that left. And so what I see, first of all, I see another thing here too when you think about he sent, Abraham sent all of his goods with him with this servant. And I, I think about this with Jesus when he rose from the dead and he gave gifts unto men, right? And, he, and all the riches of Christ that come with him and all these different avenues, spiritually speaking, of course. And so all that fits and, and goes in, into the same aspect. Verse 11, it says, and he, w and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening E uh, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God my, uh, of my master, Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master, Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of this city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be also she that ha thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. So, what we see here is that obviously she does this, but he doesn't say to her, feed all my camels, right? So, she, he, he's just saying, give me something to drink. And he's saying, now if she gives me something to drink, and then she says, hey, I'll, feed all your, I'll give all your camels drink too, then I'll know. So it's something that's going to have to come out of her own heart to want to do. You know, it's not like it was just told her to do or she was asked to do it. And so you think it's somebody that does things or helps someone out without being asked, right? And so I see that as a virtuous woman there. And so in, in, in go to Proverbs chapter 31. I'm just going to show you a couple places. Um, just uh, mainly one verse, but Proverbs 31 verse 10 is the famous verse where it says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? And think about this. What did he give, what did he give Rebecca as soon as he, she did what she did? Gave her earrings of gold and bracelets of gold. And so it's kind of like, here's your rubies, right, so to speak, for being a virtuous woman. And so uh, who can find a virtuous woman? You know, she's worth more than, than all that gold that he gave her, right? But in Proverbs 31 and 20, Verse 20, it says, She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. And so that, that, that selfless charity, so to speak. And that's what she was doing for this guy. I mean, it's not like she was promised that gold. It's not like he said, I'll give you a ring of uh, earrings of gold and bracelets. You know, he just said, hey, can you give me some water? And she's like, yes, and I'll also feed your camels, expecting nothing. Right? And so that's a virtuous woman right there. And at the, at the end of the chapter, obviously, it says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And so we see all this with Rebecca. She was a very virtuous woman. But, you know, and also it's interesting, go back to Genesis chapter 24. She wasn't, it's not like she was ugly, right? So just be, you know, it's not like virtuous woman equals like you're not good looking, okay? It just means that that's the most important thing, right? It's not all about the looks. It's about what's in your heart. What, what, what type of person are you? And so, uh, but it actually says that she was, she was fair to look upon. And she tells who she's from. Now remember in, in Genesis chapter 23, after uh, Sarah died and was buried, he went through this whole spiel about Nahor and like the the sons that he had and all this stuff and it talked about Rebecca. Well that's being brought up here again 
to, to prove that she's of Abraham's brethren. Okay, so if you think about this, Isaac marries his cousin, so to speak, right? And so when we get into the fact of obviously he's going to do exactly what Abraham did, where he's going to say, this is my sister, you know, it's, it's kind of true in the fact that they're relatives by distance, right? Um, just like Abraham said that. But in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 15, it says, And it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor. So Nahor had a son, Bethuel, and Bethuel had, um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. So Beth Bethuel was born of Milcah. So anyway, um, it's Abraham's brother, and, and basically just stating who she's from. And so she, this keeps coming up. This stuff's repeated a lot in this chapter. That's why it's a long chapter. Um, but notice in verse 16, And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And so what's actually interesting, this is the first time the word virgin is ever mentioned in the Bible. And it defines itself. right? And that's what you'll usually find with words in the Bible is that it'll define itself. What does it mean if they're a virgin? It means that she, she had neither, neither had any man known her. And in Revelation chapter 14, it works the same thing for men. Men that are virgins were not defiled with women. And why it says defiled is because if you're not married, then you'd be defiled, right? But if you're married, the uh, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And so, uh, what, what does a virgin mean? It means that you're pure, pure from having that physical act that married people have without being married, right? And so, this just defines that, but she was fair to look upon. So, she, she was a good-looking girl that was a virgin and a virtuous woman. So, everything that Isaac would want, right? <laughs> so, um, so, he's really happy at this point. You know, that, that she does what, what he, he wanted her to do and what he said, if she does this, then she's the one. And so, um, you know, that's, that's where he brings, uh, goes to Laban's house. And, uh, yeah, I didn't write down all the stuff that I, I didn't know how long I would take on this because it's such a long chapter. Um, but what's interesting, too, is the fact that um, when, you, when you deal with this story, is the fact that when they go to Laban's house, or to Rebecca's house, you're usually talking about Laban. Laban, Laban, Laban. And Laban's his, her brother, right? But Bethuel is actually, you know, alive <laughs> because it talks about how they were, they were talking with Bethuel and Laban. And I'm missing it because I didn't write it down. Um... I gotta find it. Yeah, in verse 50. So it only mentions it once. So, you know, it's interesting because it keeps talking about Laban and, his, and her mother and her. And even when they're leaving, it's Laban and her mother that's kind of like talking to this servant. But Bethuel's there, there right? The, her father is there. And so in verse uh, 50, it says, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded forth. Or proceedeth from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. So Bethuel's there. I just, I just, I don't know. When I was reading that, I was just like, you know, what? I'm, I'm always thinking it's just Laban, you know, like her brother and her mother. And so, uh, but Rebecca, Rebecca decides to go. So he basically, the, the whole story here is he comes, he finds Rebecca, he goes into their house, and they, they take him in. Okay, and you can kind of think about this with soul winning and how, you know, when you come to a house and, and the, the peace of the Son of Man be there, you know, and how, if they'll take you in kind of thing. Um, so obviously, this is a story of a receptive, you know, if you're going to look at the spiritual aspect of it, this is a story of a successful soul winning experience, right? You come there, they receive you, they get saved, you know, that's what you're looking for, right? And that's what we see here with Rebecca. So in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 58, it says, And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Because when we see the story here is that basically stays the night there 
And he's like, I need to be on my way. You know, I want Rebecca to come with me to take her to, to my master. And so I think about this with soul winning and, and, and the fact that, you know, we need to be, you know, we need to be on going and going and going. And, and people are always, um, it, it may be down on you for like, you know, you're going from one door to another or whatever, but you know what? There's a lot of people that need to get saved. And you think about Jesus when he was on this earth, he was constantly going. He's like, he's like, you need to follow me now. He's like, hey, I don't have, you need to let the dead bury their dead. I got places to go. I got things to do, right? And that's one thing that I see with Jesus is, uh, you know, immediately straightway, you know, they're constantly, he's going, he's like, this, I have to go into the next town. I got to go into this town. I got to go. And so the servant is just like, he's not, he's not just uh, loitering, you know, at this guy's house, which he could have. And would have been welcome there. He could just stay there and relaxed and had a good time. But he 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 was on a mission, right? He's like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get Isaac a wife. I'm going to take him. You know, like he's got this oath that he's trying to keep, and he's wanting to get it done, right? And so that mentality of wanting to fulfill that oath uh, needs to be in our mind with soul winning. But in uh, verse 59, there it says, and they sent away Rebecca. Their or, I'm sorry. Uh, in verse 58 there, notice that they give her the choice. Okay? Remember how she had to be willing? And whosoever will, let him take up the water of the life freely. And so, this also shows you too, I'm against arranged marriages. Okay? I, just, I, I, I don't think anybody, you know, there's, there's still people that like are for arranged marriages, but I'm against it. Okay? I'm not against veto power. Okay, if my girls were to like bring in some loser, I'd be like, he needs to get out of here now, <laughs> right? Or before I beat him into the pulp, right? I won't do that because I'm a pastor, not supposed to be a brawler, right? Disclaimer. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that I'm not against veto power, where you say, no, not that person. But I'm, I'm, I'm against where you say, okay, this is the person you're going to marry, you're locked into this, you don't have a choice. I'm against that because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible is always talking about it's your choice, you know, whosoever you will, only in the Lord. And in this case, Rebecca had a choice. It's not like they came and they like sold their sister to this guy, you know. And, and obviously, you know, he gave her money and gifts and treasures and all that stuff it talks about in here. So you kind of think of the dowry. And you kind of think how that works today when you think of like an engagement ring, right? And, and some people are against engagement rings. I'm not against you if you're against engagement rings. But it is a way to kind of show, hey, I'm serious about this. You know, I'm serious enough that I'm putting a lot of money on your finger right there to where, uh, you know, I am kind of, it's kind of like an, uh, an earnest, <laughs> so to speak, on, on, on her. And, and notice that he gives her a lot of stuff, right? But then he also gives her family a lot of stuff too. And so, um, but she has a choice, and she chooses to go. Obviously, salvation is the same way, right? You go through the door, you give them the gospel, they have a choice to either receive it or reject it. You know, and when you think of salvation, you know, so to speak, when you get saved, you're, you're getting married to Christ, so to speak. And that's what it talks about. You know, and when it talks about uh, in, in uh, Romans chapter 7, which we're going to actually show, I'm going to show you that, but... We're, we're supposed to be espoused unto Christ. And so th that's what it's kind of likened to. But we had the choice. We're not forced into that. And so just like Rebecca wasn't forced into marrying Isaac, none of us were forced into getting saved. We had to make that choice of our own will. And notice uh, in, in verse 60 here, there's an interesting thing that's, that's said here. In verse 60 it says, And they, they blessed Rebecca and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. What's interesting about this verse that gets, always catches my ear is when it says millions. This is the only place in the Bible that the number millions is used. Now, millions as far as like, th that number, millions are used in the Bible, but the, the word millions not used, right? When, it, when you talk about the army, of the second woe, right? The sixth trumpet. It's 200,000 thousand. What is that? 200 million. But it doesn't say million. It doesn't say 200 million. It says 200,000 thousand. Here it says uh, that, she, that she'd be the mother of thousands of millions. What's thousands of millions? Billions. Right? And when you think about this, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Does that sound familiar? 
Because that was said in Genesis chapter 22. And so in Genesis chapter 22, it, you know, this is the, the, where God swore by himself. In Genesis 22 and verse 17, at the end there, it says, Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And remember, when we're talking about this, thy seed shall be as the sand which is on upon the seashore. So all this stuff, it, it's interesting because this is said about Isaac, but it's also being said about Rebekah. Right? And we saw how Sarah represented New Jerusalem and all this stuff. So you see how, how these men like Abraham and, and Sarah are representing these allegories, so to speak. And same thing with Isaac. Isaac is definitely a huge picture of Jesus Christ. And Rebecca would be a huge picture of the bride of Christ. And, and also how the bride of Christ, if you think about it, the spirit and the bride say come. Right? The bride is winning other people to the bride, so to speak. And so all this stuff fits together. Um, but I always just thought that was interesting, that millions. You know, when I see one, a word that's used like one time, it's always interesting to me. But millions um, would imply billions. So there's at least billions of, of saved people. And I would, I mean, think about throughout the space of time, right? That's probably very true that there's billions. And it's a, it's a number which no man can number. Now, that could also just mean that you're not going to be able to number, like, I probably wouldn't be able to number a billion people. Like, if there's a billion people outside right now, I don't think I could number it, right? And so, it doesn't mean that it's not a number that could, could be, like, said, right? Because obviously, uh, eventually, you'd be able to, to figure out how many people are in heaven, right? But it's just a huge number. It's not a number that you're going to be able to figure out. Like, they would figure out the 5,000 that were fed and all this other stuff. The last thing I want to talk about is at the end of the chapter here. Um, well, one, you know, when Isaac comes out, when, when, when Rebecca's coming to him, he's meditating out in the field. So think about this. Rebecca is this, this virtuous woman. And then Isaac, so we just think about marriage here, just on the physical aspect of a husband and wife and what you're looking for. Well, men, you're looking for that Rebecca. You're looking for that virtuous woman that is wanting to help people out and help the needy without being asked. Right? That's the person and not expecting a reward for it. Charity. Someone that's, that's, that has charity. Well, women, you need to be looking for the, the, the man that's out there meditating in the field at night, you know, in the evening. That's meditating on the Word of God day and night. That's what you need to be looking for because when Isaac, it says in verse 63, because she's coming with, uh, with the Abraham's servant. And it says in verse 63, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. So Isaac was, he was, he, it sounds like this is something he did all the time. He would just go out at the eventide and just meditate. Now, I don't believe he was out there like the, like the, the Buddhists, and he was like, home, oh, you know, like whatever they do, and like space out and you know, go off in their own little zone. No, when he was meditating, I believe he was meditating on the Word of God. And so, that's the kind of man that you need to be looking for. As a guy that's, you know, it, it says, we're in First John chapter uh, 2, where it says, I've written unto you, uh, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. There's a lot of stuff in there. Well, ladies, you know, what, you know what you need as far as a young man? You need someone that's strong, you need someone that has the Word of God abiding in them, and you need someone that's overcome the wicked one because they've overcome the world by believing on Jesus Christ. Right? Obviously, the believing on Jesus Christ is number one. You need to, be, you need to have that. But you, I would say spiritually, you need to have someone that's strong. But you need, you need also a, a strong man in general. Okay? You know, if you have a choice in the matter, have someone that, uh, that you can't, like, out bench press. Okay, you know, uh, and, and I feel like people today, they're just like, I mean, the men today are just really weak. And so that's a side note. I don't know how I got off on that. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that uh, Jacob, we're going to get into Jacob, and Jacob was not a weak guy. You know, we're going to see those stories. And people try to say that about him. They're like, oh, he was a plain man, and Esau was this, like, really tough guy. And it's like, yeah, well, we're going to see where that's not true. Um, but... You want a guy that's meditating on the Word of God. Someone that's memorizing the Bible. Someone that is just like thinking about the Bible. 
because that's the kind of godly man that you want. And so this is a great passage to kind of show both sides even. Even at the very end, we kind of see with, with Isaac um, what kind of man he was. But in, in Genesis chapter um, 24 and verse 67, the last verse there, and I bring this up because this is something that it's just weird. It's, it's something that's being uh, pushed out there as far as marriage goes. This last verse, I've, I've heard people bring this up to try to say why, you know, the government shouldn't be involved in marriages at all or there shouldn't be any marriage licenses, okay? In Genesis chapter 24 and verse 67, it says, And Isaac brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole dissertation on this, okay? But go to Romans chapter 7. Because obviously what it's talking about there is consummating a marriage, right? And that is part of it, okay? If you were just to, you know, say the vows, but you didn't consummate the marriage, then you didn't get married, okay? And that's where the annulment comes in as far as, or what the biblical annulment would kind of be, um, where that could work out to where it wouldn't be adultery or whatever. And, uh, but... The consummation is obviously a huge, that's a big part of it. I mean, that's, the, that's how everything, con, you know, that's what consummation even means is to complete something, right? But that doesn't mean that's the only thing that's involved, okay? And people say this too, if someone were to commit fornication, they'll say, well, you've married that person. No, <laughs> okay? Yes, fornication is wrong. And yes, when you join with a harlot, you're becoming one flesh, so to speak. But that's not the only part of marriage, Right? That's, not, that's, the only, that's the only thing that happened. When, when I got married with Holly, it's not the only thing that we did. You know, we, we said our vows before God, before everybody, and we signed a piece of paper to the law. And, this, and Romans chapter 7 is really proving that. In Romans chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Now, just think about this logically. If adultery is punished by the death penalty, how could it not be bound by the law? How could it not be something that it has to be by law, right? Because you could just say, well, we never really got married. Therefore, it's not adultery. But if it's on the books, that's how the death penalty... I mean, you're talking capital punishment for committing adultery, it has to be by the law, right? That's the only way that that could work. And so, it, you know, this whole idea of like, you just come into your mother's tent, this, this stuff is kind of becoming a little more rampant where people are kind of getting away from this. And here's the thing, the government doesn't have that many jobs it's supposed to do, okay? Let's just be honest. But the one thing, that, the only thing that the Bible talks about that the government's job is, is the punishment of evildoers and the praise of them to do well. It's not to take care of people with welfare. It's not to build the roads, by the way. And I'm tired of people saying this, you know, like talking about like, oh, where are the roads? You know, what's going to happen with the roads? Since when was the government efficient at anything? And show me in the Bible where the government, where God ordained the government to build the roads. Okay? God only ordained government for the punishment of evildoers. And obviously adultery would be under that classification. Right? And so that's why... I believe that you should get a marriage license. It should be, it should be something that's of the government. Be now, here's the thing. You may say, well, the government doesn't enforce that. I understand that, <laughs> okay? But that doesn't make it, you know, like two wrongs don't make a right. That doesn't mean that you still shouldn't do it that way, okay? And so, but here's the thing. If, if someone's coming up to you, ladies, if a guy comes up to you and says, listen, I want to get married, but I don't want to have a marriage certificate, then you need to tell that guy to hit the road. Because all that tells you is that they're not serious about it. Because that just is giving them a way out. And so, uh, here's the thing. I mean, it, when I take my, when I, when, I, when I got married, I'm taking that before God. And to me, that's even more of a serious thing than what the government would say to me. You know, even if our government, obviously our government doesn't care anymore when it comes to those type of things. But all that to be said, who cares if the government would approve? It's what God thinks anyway. And so what would it matter if the government has something on that? Because to you, it should be the fact that we're staying together. So anyway, that, that's something that I've heard people say, I don't agree with it. The Bible says that you're bound by the law. And so that's 
you know, what the Bible teaches on that. But this is a great passage just to kind of show, um, obviously, uh, Isaac, a good man, a good godly man, and finding a, a virtuous woman. And this is a very, this is a miraculous story on how this happens and how God led his servant to her. But you can also see the parallel in this and how Abraham would be like God the Father, Isaac would be like God the Son, the servant would be like the soul winner, and the angel would be like the Holy Ghost. And obviously, Rebecca would be like the person getting saved, the Christian that would be getting saved. So all this stuff, it's, it's, kind of, it, it's just amazing how deep the Bible is and how everything fits together. And it just every time you read through like the Old Testament, you see all these pictures and see all this stuff, it just keeps reminding you on how infinite the Bible is and how perfect it is. And how no man could have ever done this. Okay? No man would have been writing this story back in those days and then perfectly parallel that in the New Testament. It's just not possible. But uh, anyway, that's uh, Genesis chapter 24. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Pray that you be with us as we go out through the rest of the week with work, and pray that you'd uh, uh, bless us at our jobs, help us to provide for our families, and Lord, we pray that you give us uh, safe travels home, give us safety on the road, especially if it's, it's storming or raining. Lord, just pray that you'd be with us, protect us, and Lord, we love you and pray all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.